To put this simply, one of the most powerful things that any person can do is to learn to control this idea of duration, path, and outcome and attach an internal sense of reward. A little bit goes a long way, a lot goes even further, but it also takes you down deeper afterwards. They essentially have an infinite amount of energy and a focus to pursue those yeah. goals. And I think one of the most important findings in the last few years in neuroscience is that while the molecule dopamine is associated with reward, it's more about motivation and craving. So when I say dopamine is the universal currency of everything, what I mean is the molecule dopamine, when secreted in the brain, makes us pursue things, build things, create things. The power of dopamine, if we can utilize it as a tool, is that it makes us want things that we don't already have. Dopamine operates on both short and long time scales, influencing our daily mood and also our evaluation of our life's progress. Whether we wake up feeling invigorated or low or assess our position halfway through a degree or life itself, dopamine subtly shapes our perceptions. So you're always comparing it and all of this is subconscious. But what's cool is that once you make these processes conscious, once you understand a little bit about how dopamine is released and how it changes our perspective and our behavior, then you can actually work with it. And so we go back to this example of the person that's not motivated, that can't get off the couch, that doesn't want to do anything. Well, this is the problem. They are effectively the rat with no dopamine, but they can still achieve some sense of pleasure by consuming excess calories, by consuming social media. And look, I'm not judging, I do this stuff too, right? Scrolling social media. If you've ever scrolled social media and you're like, I don't even know why I'm doing this. It doesn't really feel that good. Research suggests that individuals experiencing dopamine fatigue often fall into two distinct patterns of behavior. One characterized by the relentless pursuit of dopaminergic stimuli, such as drugs or addictive behaviors, and the other marked by a reliance on opioid-like activities, such as excessive social media use or overeating. The former group becomes consumed by the pursuit of intense dopamine release, often resorting to drugs like cocaine or amphetamines, which hijack the brain's reward system and create a vicious cycle of craving and consumption. Conversely, the latter group seeks solace in activities that provide fleeting pleasure, but ultimately lead to desensitization and a lack of motivation. This phenomenon highlights the delicate balance required for maintaining a healthy relationship with dopamine-producing stimuli, underscoring the need for moderation and mindfulness in the pursuit of pleasure. Dopamine itself is not the reward. It's the buildup to the reward. And the reward has more of a kind of opioid bliss-like property, which itself is not bad if it's endogenous, released from within. But when we can just sit there like the, like the rat with no dopamine, gorging ourselves with pleasures, so to speak, what you end up with is somebody that feels really unmotivated and those pleasures no longer work to tickle those feel-good circuits. And so there's no reason for them to go out and pursue anything. And that's a pretty dark picture. So the, the keys are, to pursue rewards, but understand that the pursuit is actually the reward if you want to have repeated wins, okay? You, the celebration has to be less than the pursuit, and that's hard for some people to do. If you can start to identify the craving as its own internally released drug, this thing dopamine, that is a source of motivation, then what you realize is that capturing the reward is wonderful, but attaching dopamine to the reward is actually a little bit dangerous. Celebrating so, the win, celebrating the win more than the pursuit, it actually sets you up for failure in the future. And oh so this God. gets us right into something called dopamine reward prediction error. And reward prediction error is basically if you expect something to be really great, and then it's not quite that great, your dopamine baseline lowers. The most important detail about dopamine that Andrew Huberman highlights is that dopamine should not be the neurochemical associated with winning and finishing tasks, but the neurochemical associated with motivation in the process of completing the task itself. The dopamine reward prediction error can be summarized as when we expect a reward and it arrives as predicted, dopamine is released, reinforcing the associated behavior. If it's less than we predicted, the opposite effect happens leading to fatigue and lack of motivation to repeat the behavior. Understanding dopamine reward prediction error can be instrumental in shaping behaviors. By leveraging this concept, you can reinforce desired habits 
or break unwanted ones. If we treat the reward prediction error less about receiving the reward itself and more about the anticipation leading up to it, this anticipation can trigger the dopamine release and influence our energy levels, attention, and motivation. Take going to the gym, for instance. A lot of people quit working out because after a week of hard effort, they do not see any meaningful changes in their appearance. They work out with the picture of the response in mind, but when it's not there, their motivation crumbles. Those who continuously work out, go for daily runs, and eat healthy, do it not because they see daily improvements in their appearance, but find fulfillment in the act of maintaining and constantly improving their health. Dopamine fuels this perpetual motivation to go back to the gym or waking up early to go for daily jogs, leading to the infinite dopamine loop. And now understanding what we know about dopamine, that means that not only did you, you feel as if you lost because it wasn't as much a celebration as you thought it would be, but it also means that you're starting from a lower place, meaning you are less motivated. Anytime you have a bunch of dopamine and you're in pursuit, 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 after you achieve a win, now this could be a, a business win, a relationship, a win of any kind, but inevitably there's going to be a tipping back of the scale on the pain side. And that pain side is always gonna go a little bit higher than the dopamine side. So this is what you would feel if you pursued a goal like building a big company, here it comes, here it comes, the big sale, and then there's the, well, what now? You have the kind of letdown. Now, if you wait, if you simply wait and stop pursuing dopamine for a short while, the scale starts to reset. The problem is a lot of people immediately roll right into the next pursuit. And then what happens is that scale starts to get stuck on the pain side. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. And pretty soon, no amount of seeking will allow you to experience that craving and motivation. So what, what does this mean in terms of a, an actual tool? Well, first of all, if people can do what you do, they're going to be in a much better position in life. Doesn't matter if it's school, sport, relationship, any domain of life. If you can start to register, ah, that craving and that friction and that desire, that almost kind of low level of agitation, sometimes high level of agitation, that is that I'm trying to impose my will on the world in a benevolent way, we hope, that's dopamine. As a tool, dopamine and epinephrine neurotransmitters weren't specifically crafted for survival against tigers or for modern day business endeavors. Instead, they serve a broader purpose, adaptability. In the animal world, stress, signaled by cortisol, propels actions like hunting or searching for food and mates. Dopamine, on the other hand, acts as a reward system, reinforcing successful behaviors while suppressing those leading to failure. This mechanism, crucial for survival, is deeply rooted in neuroplasticity the brain's ability to change in response to experiences. Dopamine, a key player in neuroplasticity, reinforces behaviors associated with success, guiding us along the right path. When predators are hunting and get a smell of their prey, their brain releases dopamine and epinephrine to give the predator their energy to commit the hunt. Conversely, it discourages repeating actions linked to failure. This intricate system ensures adaptability by favoring actions that have yielded positive outcomes in the past. It's working with its close cousin, which is epinephrine, which is adrenaline. They are very close cousins. In fact, dopamine manufactures epinephrine. A lot of people don't know this, but adrenaline is actually made from the molecule dopamine. Okay, so those Jesus. two are hanging out together. It's like crave work, crave work, crave and work, crave and work, crave and work. And then you get the win. And some people allow the big peak in dopamine to be associated with the win. And smart people learn to adjust their celebration internally, right? This is all internal. You could throw the biggest party in the world, but as long as you're kind of in, laid back and looking at this, not letting yourself get manic crazy, you won't necessarily crash as hard. And pretty soon your system will reset so that you take the day, you clean up the dishes, you relax, you go, well, what now? I'm feeling a little low. Well, rather than going out and spiking your dopamine again, just wait, understand that the scale will reset again. Give yourself a few days where you're gonna feel a little kind of underwhelmed. Things aren't gonna be as interesting. It's gonna be hard to trigger that big release because you just had the, the peak. Well, if you adjust that, you relax, you understand there's always a little bit of a postpartum depression. 
we sometimes hear about postpartum depression, that's a clinical thing, but there's always that kind of, hmm, today's not as exciting as a previous days. What, what am I gonna do with my life? But then, if you let it start ratcheting up again, then what you realize is your capacity to tap into dopamine as a motivator, not just seeking dopamine rewards, that is infinite. And I, I can say with, with great certainty that this is how you were able to build a big company and sell it, how you've been able to build a successful podcast and sell it, how you're constantly seeking because seeking is the reward. And I think for most people, we think of the reward as the finish line. And so the key is to get to the finish line, step into the end zone, but no end zone dance. It's just like, yep, and now I'm gonna go do it again.